ever done transcranial ultrasound? Yes. Perfect. Very good. In, in kids or adults? Newborn, not newborn. Newborn. The anterior fontanel. Yes. Perfect. But in the anterior fontanel, we measure ventricles, not. No, we can't measure the cerebral artery. Cerebral artery. What is the cerebral artery? We can measure flow through them. Okay. We don't but have a lot of studies, but, 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 but yep. yes. Some research about it. But you are using a linear probe. Using no, the cranial. Uh, the, the, uh, sometimes use the linear. Sometimes use the. Uh, Phased array. Yes, the phased okay. array. Okay. Perfect. Good. So. I have two uh, challenging persons here, so I, I guess the discussion will be fantastic. Okay, so my name is Walid Saad Habashi, I'm an easy and critical care registrar in Ireland, and uh, an easy and critical care consultant in Egypt. Uh, so, five, six qualification. Uh, it's my pleasure to be with you here, and the third year in sequence, in sequence in uh, Azaik. Thanks for invitation. So our objectives in the transcranial ultrasound first to detect the anatomy of the brain blood supply approach to transcranial Doppler and few cases at it. This is a <coughs> published study about transcranial Doppler as a diagnostic tool and it's in anesthesiology, current opinion in anesthesiology. So it's coming in anesthesia perhaps. So it's coming in anesthesiology journal. So it is not anymore for radiographers not anymore for just intensivists. It's an era even in intraoperative monitoring under anesthesia because I'm basically anesthetist. Okay, so anatomy, we have three approaches, three different approaches to scan for circle of willis. So the first one is the acoustic window will be the ophthalmic artery. And the second one is through foramen magnum, checking for the vertebral basilar system. And the third one is, which we use very commonly, which is transtemporal. So transtemporal, transorbital, and transforaminal, which is meant for foraminal. Up to 10% of people don't show transtemporal window. So don't be frustrated if your first patient does not show any window. But you have to check about your game and everything if you get two, three patients in a sequence and you don't have any window. So transtemporal for anterior middle and cerebral arteries and interstitial arteries, transorbital for the ophthalmic, and transraminal for the vertebral basilar arteries. Just a quick review of the blood supply of the brain. So that's the arch of aorta, sending me the common carotid artery, which divides into external and internal carotid, ascends in the brain. This is the vitreous bone, and it divides here into the septal bullies giving the middle cerebral artery and the anterior cerebral artery branch. Vertebral basilar system, so the vertebral arteries running through the foramina, then through the foramen magnum, and then gives me two vertebral arteries joined to the zoi and then joined to give me the basilar artery. So this is the circle of Willis, okay? So this is the internal carotid artery, which is coming from here, and then divides here into the middle cerebral artery and anterior cerebral artery, so this is anterior communicating branch between the two anterior cerebral arteries. And then this is two basilar arteries coming from right and left, joined together, making the vertebral arteries. And this is posterior cerebral arteries which divides again. And the communicating artery between middle and posterior cerebral arteries on each side called posterior communicating. Is that clear? Okay, I'm taking this circle of bullets and pushing it to <coughs> right to left, just to familiarize yourself with the image in the ultrasound. So it is the same image, but this is middle cerebral artery on the right side, middle cerebral artery on the left side, and tear cerebral artery, and tear communicating two posterior cerebral arteries and posterior communicating. And here in this area in between them, this is the brain stem of the patient. This is how the anatomy looks like, and here inside the bone, so this is the vitreous bone, okay? And from the vitreous bone, I find the first part of the middle cerebral artery, we call this part is the siphon. We have to search for that initially because sometimes it's really, really difficult to get the arterial pulsations in the beginning. So I will search for the bone, which is very characteristic in ultrasound imaging, and then check where is the siphon inside the bone. This is your middle cerebral artery. Usually you get the middle cerebral artery at the depth of three to five millimeters, sorry, three to five centimeters from the 
the skin. If you go more deep, you will find the posterior cerebral artery. Do you see? Compare this to this depth. Okay, that's the technique they used initially when they had no color with transcranial Doppler using no ultrasound. Okay, so this is what exactly you can see by ultrasound. So this is the image. You are coming here. This is the skin, and this is the brain tissue after the skull, and the skull is the other side. Orientate yourself. Your your mouth is anterior, so this is the front of the patient, uh, and the other side is posterior. So this is the back of the head. So he, here is the eyes, and then this is middle cerebral artery, and anterior cerebral artery. We may find anterior communicating sometimes, and here is the posterior cerebral artery. Are you familiar with this image? Anybody is unhappy yet? I have. Okay. So if we magnify this image again, <coughs> middle cerebral artery. It can be red if it's you towards your bow on this side, and this one will be in blue because it's moving away from the brain. Okay? Away from, so it's on the bow, not on the brain. Okay? And this is two anterior arteries, two posterior cerebral arteries. Perfect? Okay. So what we measure? The first thing is the resistive index. The machine can measure that for me with systole and diastole. Systole minus diastole divided by systole, and my cutoff is 0.6. So this is normal resistance in this. EMAP is a time to reach uh, the peak velocity. So this is time of peak velocity. Peak systolic and end diastolic velocities. So what's the values of transcranial ultrasound? There's a proven benefits that nobody can deny it now, but you can do that on elective or semi-urgent basis, like sickle cell disease patients. They do follow up from two to 16 year old kids every month or two. And once they reach any velocity higher than 200, this patient is at high risk of stroke, so they transfuse him to minimize hemoglobin S to minimize the risk of stroke in this patient. So subarachnoid hemorrhage, vasospasm, it usually starts like from third to seventh day after subarachnoid hemorrhage. So if you get a baseline and you know how the velocities of these patients, you can discover early that this patient is going to have a cerebral vasospasm. Even nebulipine does not prevent 100% instant cerebral vasospasm, but if you discover your patient is showing high velocities, this is the time to use the triple H therapy. Okay, hypermolemia, hypertension, and hydration. So carotid end arteriotomy, and this is a new era now. A new monitoring system is coming to our theaters for carotid end arteriotomies. They take, there's a nice study that they use the probe, and then they fix the probe with the sheets, and they started after that the carotid end arteriotomies, and once flow drops below 15, this is definitely cerebral ischemia. It's 15 to 60 from his baseline, that's potential ischemia. So <coughs> that's very good intraoperative monitoring for the coronary cerebral perfusion in this patient. It's definitely used now as a definitive tool, 100% specificity for uh, cerebral circulatory arrest. I cannot say brain death. Brain death is a clinical diagnosis, but cerebral circulatory arrest means there's no more blood flow to the brain in this area. High ICP, acute ischemic stroke, and traumatic brain injury. This is all <coughs> very good benefit. Promising evidence is coming in the way. Okay, so here, this is the cut of 200 centimeters internal carotid artery or, or, or in the middle cerebral artery, strongly associated with the stroke. This is scan from two to 16 years old, and this is an indicative of uh, transfusion therapy for kids with hemoglobin S to increase more than 30%. Cerebral vasospasm, as we talked, the normal mean velocity in the middle cerebral artery is less than 80. Mean, not systolic. Mm -hmm. So I will measure the middle cerebral artery mean velocity if it's less than 80 centimeters per second, usually in this range, with the difference in kids, I'll show you a table now. And if it's less than 120, it's mild. If it's more than 160, up to 200 is moderate and severe if more than 200. This is the mean velocity. Okay, length guard ratio. If I have high velocity on the middle cerebral artery, it could be either or. It could be the cerebral vasospasm. So this increase is because of constriction in the middle cerebral artery, that cerebral vasospasm, or it could be from the internal carotid artery, that is a lymphatic overflow because of hypertension, your patient awake, you need to discriminate that. Is it a vasospasm really, or it is from the root 
of the internal carotid artery. So I'm taking my linear probe, scanning the internal carotid artery, and measure the velocity there. Imagine your velocity here is 200, and here is 200. So where is the origin? It's the internal carotid. So this is ratio of one, 200 and 200. Does it make any sense? If the velocity here is 200, but in the internal carotid artery, it is still 200, the same. So the problem is not a vasospasm in the internal, in, in the middle cerebral artery. It is hypertension or hibernia. So this is the problem. So that's the idea of limb guard. So I'm dividing the middle cerebral artery velocity, low velocity, on the internal carotid artery low velocity. If this is 400 and this is 80, which is normal, so this is definitely a cerebral vasospasm. Does it make any sense? So if the ratio is less than three, it is high premium hypertension, or the origin is the internal carotid artery, sedate your patient well. This is not a vasospasm. Three to six is a mild to moderate vasospasm. More than six is severe vasospasm. Again, as I said, it can be used as preoperative in intraoperative or postoperative in carotid and arteriotomies, either to monitor intraoperative ischemia or postoperative thrombosis embolism ischemia or hyperperfusion. Ischemic stroke and clot lysis. There is a clobust trial, nice trial, that they can do clot lysis under ultrasound guidance and they can get a benefit of, and this is the only modality that you can use transcranial ultrasound as a therapeutic guidance modality. So traumatic brain injury, as we said, if your patient ICP is increasing, that means your flow velocity will decrease. So if you find middle cerebral artery flow velocity less than 40, we said the, the normal is 45 to 86. So if it's less than 40, with a high pulsatility index more than 1.5, that's poor six months outcome, so prognostication too. Cerebral circularity arrest, as it said, 100% specificity, sensitivity 96.5 for circulatory arrest. This is currently accepted as a confirmatory test, but not, sorry. So I need to say that all these lectures will be uploaded in a YouTube channel. You can find that in two, three weeks on a YouTube channel at the moment. So this is the cutoffs. And you see this is mean velocity on the middle cerebral artery. And this is five to 10 year old and up to 60 years. You see that the figures are really different. The younger you are, the flow velocity is the higher. Okay? We are concerned mainly with, with the middle cerebral artery. If we find time, we do also vertebral valvular testing. So this is how you measure the mean velocity. If you have in your machine, am I late? If you have in your machine a transcranial Doppler software, so you can calculate pulsatility index and mean velocity. And if you don't have that, you can use the cardiac phase the array probe, and you can put it as an aortic valve velocity time integral. It will give you the velocity maximum and the velocity mean. So you just trace the flow. If it's if you have a transcranial ultrasound software, you just put a lot here and a lot here to calculate everything for you. Systolic, diastolic, pulsatility index, and mean flow. Mean flow velocity. Okay? This is a patient who is showing normal, as we say the mean is 46, 46 to 85 or 45 to 86. And this is like a 37 Okay, so almost normal according to the age, if it's less uh, older age. So this is another patient with 120 systolic. Diastole is like 35. We really check if diastole is lower than 35 or that's less than 30. This is again a poor prognostic sign because brain perfusion should be constant systolic and diastolic. It's a low resistance circulation. So this is a patient here, you see diastolic flow is almost, almost zero or 10. This is a patient with low velocity during diastole. This patient is really highly susceptible to brain ischemia. You have to check what is the problem. If this patient really has no basement foramen valley or any other cardiac lesions that signify this one, and this is not your baseline, you have your baseline like this one, and all of a sudden you find this one, treat on the line cause as fast as you, as you can because this is going to be cerebral ischemia in few minutes, okay? And this is the flow reversal, the characteristic of brain death. You see there is poor systolic flow, less than 40, and no diastolic flow, even it's a negative diastolic flow. 
Again, a check if your patient has taken foramen ovary, and that's his baseline, that's fine if he's doing that, like that. Co conscious patient doing like that, yes, there's a problem with his circulation, like taken foramen ovary or something like that. But if this is something new, that's a flow reversal, sensitive and specific for cerebral circulatory arrest. Clear? Any questions? Questions? Stage one. Yes. It could be stage one. It could be cerebral hypoperfusion only. It depends. So if this patient is hypotensive now and he, his blood pressure is like 60 over 30, and you manage that, there's a high possibility that this is that's that's the point with the sensitivity and specificity actually, because you cannot judge the image only. If you want to assess any sensitivity and specificity for a test, you are just testing this test, but you're not adding the clinical picture. So I'm talking about patients, is uh, is knee coma, uh, maybe uh, class 4, 4, 5. Okay. And uh, his blood pressure just maintained like uh, 9 to 30 by uh, post pressure high dose. Okay. Then I... And, and I have this image. Yes. That's a poor prognostic. That could be a stage 1 circulatory arrest, as you said. Yes. Could I'm be. About Okay, if you look at here, it's 90. Yes. So systemic is 90. So I would take that very cautiously to say this is a vasoconstriction or overconstriction. Yes. I, I, I cannot put him in, in this category. I say it's vasopressor induced. Yeah. I cannot say that. Because if I can, if I find that this is like really high, like 140, 150, very high velocity, and there is no diastolic flow, you can hear. So the comment here on the diastolic flow. What yes. Is the diastolic flow in this? So you see, diastolic flow, this is 40, so this is like 10, yes. which is very low diastolic flow. Uh -huh. So it's asking what is that? We get, we get a similar picture in cases of a hemodynamically significant PDA taking the tissue to Yes. Yes. Uh -huh. so yes, you have the same picture in fit and form the body and PDAs. Yeah. Yes. So this means again circulatory compromise. No, because his brain is accustomed to this one. It's not coming de nouveau in this kid. So he has this PDA from the beginning, and his brain is accustomed to this one. So this is baseline. But when we see this picture, even in our articles, this, this is significant that I should close this PDA. Does it not? Yes, but does this picture in PDA mean he has cerebral hypoperfusion in the moment? That means I, every I thought patient. So. I thought so, actually. No, because these patients actually, after closure of PDAs, they behave normal. Their cerebral perfusion like, goes back to normal. So imagine a patient with a PDA. How much time it will take him for surgery? A day or two with cerebral hypoperfusion? So it will be stroke. So it's an indicator of surgery. Yes, that's right. I had I had just a couple of patients in, in the last month with me in Ireland. The same. So we do the PDA, we do the, the gradient and all of that, and we do the transcranial and these indicator of surgery. Yes. But does this mean in PDA it's cerebral hyperperfusion like stroke? No. It's totally different from patients who was accustomed to this image, okay, and all of a sudden, because of increased intraterritation, became like that. So this is acute insult to his brain. My brain is accustomed to normal brain perfusion, and all of a sudden I have hyperperfusion because of the stolic blood pressure is very low, or the stolic perfusion pressure is very low. It's different instance. You agree? Mm -hmm. So again, it's not the figure, it's what happened to the patient. The baseline, yes. The That's why I said here 15 minutes ago, always compared to the baseline. If I have a traumatic brain injury, take uh, optic nerve sheath diameter as a baseline. Again, take his transcranial ultrasound to know what's his baseline like. Because if you have a velocity of 120 today, and tomorrow it's 250 with a normal carotid, definitely there is a cerebral vasopathy. Definitely, because I have the baseline of the patient. That's why ultrasound 
is a beautiful tool because it's not invasive. You can do series of exams and you can compare with the baseline all the time. Mm -hmm. But you have to learn that. Maliana, if you have the, the option, if not, we will do it. Usually we do it without 